Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the most gracious and merciful. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to God, the Lord of all the worlds. It's a custom in public speaking in the Islamic tradition to quote none other than Moses, Musa alayhi salam. Rabbi Shrahli Sadri, O Lord, expand for me my breast. We ascend the emri and make easy for me my task. What are the ten minisani and untie the knot from my tongue? Yafkuhu qawli, so that they may understand my words. I begin my speech in that spirit. I'll be honest, this is not a speech that I want to deliver. But it's one I have to deliver. If I'm perfectly honest with you as my neighbors, as my friends, where my heart is right now is in a dark corner crying. Because it's become too easy for us to disregard the humanity of the person on the other side of the aisle. And I've heard too much since October 7th on all sides. No one is guilt free in any of this where that's the reaction we're having, rather than extending an open heart, we're extending a closed fist. And it's weighing on my heart, and I just, I have to put it out there because that's the position I'm in. So I ask you for your generosity of spirit to welcome whatever I share with you, knowing that that's where I'm coming from. Father Bill, I, I have immense respect for you as a theologian, as an academic, as a community leader. And I, I want to thank you for what is in essence, a very difficult forum to host, but it's one that takes immense courage and grace, and you've extended that to us, so I want to thank you for that up front. <laughs> I'm going to give you a very brief and perhaps haphazard historical explanation of of parts of the history that, as an American audience, perhaps we, we don't know or are not aware of. As our dear Imam Sheikh Abdullah shared, Muslims have been politically in the area since 638, when that episode with the Caliph Omar happened. If one jumps ahead to another famous year in the timeline, 1099 of the Common Era, the Crusades, Jerusalem is conquered. The Holy Army rolls in, and in the intersection of what one may call religious fervor and political and imperial ambition, another humanitarian catastrophe like we're seeing happens. And I encourage you after this to go read the story of what did happen at the end of the First Crusade. Not in terms of accomplishment of empire, but in terms of the humanitarian disaster that it meant for the people in the city of Jerusalem itself. Less than 100 years later, 1187 of the Common Era, someone that perhaps an American audience is familiar with, Saladin, Salahuddin, whose name is actually Yusuf bin Ayyub, Joseph, the son of Job. He recaptures the city, and in a famous episode, ransoms all of the captives of war with his own wealth, so that if they want to relocate, they may. Let's jump ahead further now. 1520. The era of Palestine has now crossed over from Mamluk imperial control to the Ottoman Empire. In a census of 1520, the Jewish population in Jerusalem is estimated to be 5,000. One may wonder where the rest of the world's Jewish population is because certainly at that time there are more than 5,000 alive. We're not going to recount the story of the destruction of the temple or the creation of the Jewish diaspora. But the point being made here is that in the centuries between Roman and later Byzantine rule, following the rule under a series of what are nominally Muslim empires, there was apparently no desire for the Jewish diaspora to go back to the land of Palestine. 
here know something historically significant which happened in the year 1492? Think for a moment. I'm talking about something else. In addition to Columbus, 1492 marked the conclusion of a 774 year conquest of the Iberian Peninsula, known as the Reconquista. As a result of the Reconquista, not only were Muslims either forcibly converted to Catholicism, put to death in gruesome ways, or expelled south of the Straits of Gibraltar, but the Jewish population in the Iberian Peninsula suffered the same fate. A Jewish population which flourished for 700 years under the political rule of the Muslim community. It's noteworthy that during the same period, the Ottoman Sultan, Bayezid II, sent ships from Istanbul and the Ottoman Empire to rescue 100,000 Jews from the conquering Christian Empire. Let's fast forward again, 20th century. The Jewish population, now dislocated from its diasporic uh, home in Europe, is estimated at 227,000 in the Ottoman Empire. But they're mostly concentrated in the large urban areas, Istanbul, Salonika, and Izmir. In some places, accounting for up to 35% of the urban population. Under Ottoman rule, Jews are allowed to migrate to Palestine. Sultan Abdul Hamid II, responding to the pogroms that the Russians are committing against the local Jewish population, allows 35,000 Jews to relocate to Palestine between 1882 and 1904. Between 1904 and 1914, another 40,000 joined them. Let's jump ahead to this colonial period. The Balfour Declaration. At the end of the First World War, ostensibly what was then the Ottoman Empire is now under the control of the, the winners, largely the British and the French. I'll, I'll read for you the actual meat of the declaration itself. This was written by Arthur Balfour, who was the British Foreign Secretary at the time, to one of the leading members of the British Jewish community. It says, I quote, his Majesty's government view, with favor, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. The colonial powers have, in essence, set the course for what we see as modern political dysfunction. Following World War I and the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the League of Nations was created, and it granted to Britain what was known as the Mandate of Palestine. The text of that declaration I just read to you was incorporated into the preamble of the official granting of the mandate. <clears throat> if anyone's curious, you can actually read it for yourself. It's been preserved in history. <clears throat> Let's jump ahead to 1947. The UN Partition Plan of 1947. It sought to divide the land to solve what they, to, to solve what they saw as an intractable political conflict. The proposition was an Arab state will be put on 43% of the land. The highlands, except Jerusalem, which would become an international zone. Perhaps a third of the coastline would also be granted. The Jewish state would be on the other 56% of the land, including the three fertile valleys, the Negev Desert, and the only access to the Red Sea to the south. At the time, the Arab state was 725,000 with 10,000 Jewish, and the Jewish state would have been 407,000 Arab and 498,000 Jewish. The numbers didn't match the reality of the suggested partition of the land. 
in 1948, at the end of what some historians would more so characterize as a civil war than a war of declaring independence, Arabs ultimately get 22% of the land for 67% of the population. Jews maintain control of 78% of the land for 33% of the population. In the decades which follow, we have a series of conflicts and wars. The Six-Day War, Israel tax areas of Egypt, Syria, and Jordanian controlled territory. Ultimately, it takes what are known as the Golan Heights, the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, this international zone. A number of years later, the Yom Kippur War. Israel is attacked by Egypt and Syria. In 1978, under the Carter administration, you have what are called the Camp David Accords between Anwar Sadat of Egypt and Menachem Begin of Israel. The normalization of relations and the eventual withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Sinai Peninsula is the result. But within this context of global treaties and the politics, the UN is in the background, declaring uh, resolutions which have their connectivity to the conflict. The UN Security Council, which is really the only meaningful council in the international apparatus, because it's the only ones which perhaps are enforceable in any meaningful way. 1967, UN Security Council Resolution 242. 1973, Resolution 338. Call for Israel to withdraw from territories occupied in these recent conflicts. Additionally, in 2016, not that long ago, the resolution states that Israel's settlement activity in these occupied territories constitutes a, quote, flagrant violation of international law and has, quote, no legal validity. Let's fast forward to 1987. The first intifada, the uprising. Hamas is established. By some sources argue, actually enabled by the Israeli political uh, endeavor because they saw it as an opportunity to separate those with religious motivations from those with secular, communist, or socialist motivations. limited hope for peace, and the first steps towards this two-state solution, an opportunity for an actual Palestinian statehood. In 1995, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, then Prime Minister of Israel, was assassinated, November 4th. He's killed by a man named Yigal Amir, who historians would characterize as a Jewish-Israeli right-wing extremist. The reason for Amir's actions? Primarily ideological. Rabin had played a crucial role in advancing the Oslo Accord peace process between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. The Oslo Accords, which aimed to achieve a peace agreement based on this two-state solution, were highly controversial in certain aspects of Israeli society. Yigal Amir, like many right-wing Israelis, viewed the concession Israel was making in the Accords as a betrayal of Jewish claims to the entire biblical land of Israel. Amir claimed that he was acting on orders from God, and even referred to a Jewish legal concept called Dean Rodef to justify his actions. This concept traditionally implies that it is permissible to kill someone who intends to harm others. Father Bill, I am. Um, in an aside here, and at, at risk, I want to say that honesty and candor are values that I think are part of friendship. Hmm. So I'm speaking from a place of honesty and candor. I know a, another speech was delivered from this very spot a number of weeks ago. My concern is the same rhetoric which led to Rabin's assassination echo some of these sentiments that I heard from where I stand during that other presentation. Let's jump to 2005. Israel withdraws its military and its settlements from Gaza. It, it must be noted 
that the opposite has happened in the West Bank and East Jerusalem since that time, where this internationally condemned annexation of territory and settlement activity has only ever increased. In 2006, Hamas is elected by democratic elections. Israel and the US, in essence, respond not with reconciliatory outreach, but with further restrictions, which just compound the political dysfunction in the area. I know you had mentioned Dr. Well had presented uh, or prepared materials and there are QR codes. I encourage you to pursue uh, follow-up on Dr. Well's resources. I'm going to end here because I don't want to belabor the history. I'd rather actually give time to the present. Our next speaker will give that presentation. As a native, as a family who are native cousins, with family who are directly impacted, I want to make sure that that is the thing that we focus on the most. But I'm going to leave you with one reflection, other than this history lesson. And I want it to be a bit more personal. A reflection as your neighbor, a reflection as a father, of three young children, a reflection as a fellow American. It's a story of a young boy named Wadia Al-Fayyid, who lived in Plainfield, Illinois, not that far from here. He was stabbed in 26 times by a man who entered his family's home and shouted, you Muslims must die. You Muslims must die. His mother, Hanan, is still recovering from the wounds she sustained during his attack. From all indications, the suspect, Joseph Chuba, the family's landlord, no less, not a stranger, their landlord, was so concerned with the fighting in Gaza that he decided to viciously and brutally take the life of a six-year-old child here in the Midwest. I share this with you for no other reason than to say that we cannot ignore the past, the present, or the future of what is taking place in Palestine. As a country, as America, our 75-year history of unilateral support for Israel at the expense of the Palestinian people has earned us the moral culpability. And the implication of this moral culpability the result of how we speak, how we think, and how we act towards Palestinians, both in Palestine and in our own backyard, in our communities, this moral culpability demands that we do better. That we stop responding to tragedy with more tragedy, to killing with more killing. As a father, as your neighbor, and as your fellow American, we must stop pouring fuel on the fire. I thank you all. I pray that God blesses you all and may peace be with you all. I will now welcome a dear community member at the Muslim Unity Center, Summer Baraka to share a presentation related to the realities of Western. 